I kind of broke into my message a little bit premature, but I'm just going to pick up where I left off on the conversation. This morning, my title is Unwavering Faith. There are two primary enemies for us as Christians. How many um, remember the, the 1980s WWF, the World Wrestling Federation, a couple of you? The rest of you just don't want to admit that you know who that is or what that is. I get it. Um, it wasn't a fan either, especially once I found out it was not. It was fake, and I know I just totally burst in someone's bubble. What do you mean, Pastor Phil? That's real. Well, they had this thing in the, their wrestling matches. Sometimes they had tag teams, and so you'd be beating on somebody, or if you were losing, you could, you could tag in the next person, and then they would switch out. Well, I believe that there's a tag team effort against you and I in our journey uh, to see the supernatural things of God come to pass. And they're, they're, they're brother and sister. They're a tag team, pride and fear. Pride and fear are working against us to stop us from experiencing all that God has for us. I've been on a journey since I began and it was even becoming aware that these, these possibilities, these supernatural things were afforded or even recorded in scripture. And I was fortunate enough, blessed enough to be around people that were talking about these things. And so I began to ask questions as a young person. Uh, well, if these were happening in the scriptures and Jesus said that this is supposed to be the signs of them that believe, uh, I, I want to know how to participate in them. And the thing that we are challenged with when we believe God for miracles is that they violate natural law. I mean, these are not supposed to happen. They're against everything that we've been taught, very specifically the scientific method, because you can't uh, prove out a miracle. A miracle goes against what is established. And so when we are stepping out into the miraculous things of God, there is fear that tells you all the reasons why it won't work. And then pride comes right alongside and, and picks up uh, where fear leaves off. It tags it in on the way out. I have this written down in my notes about pride and fear. Pride keeps us from asking for help. Because when we see something that's impossible in our own natural ability, the self-talk, the self-dialect in our minds, we begin to say things like, well, I don't have the ability to do that. So it stops you, and it's pride because you're resting on your strength, your ability. It's also uh, something that we don't want to look stupid in. We don't want to take a risk of, of looking dumb, and so we're not going to do it. And so as a result, we miss out on God's supernatural power. And what we need is an unwavering faith in order to see some of these things that we believe God for. Unwavering means to be firm, steadfast, resolute. I already gave the example, if you came across a mom who had mistakenly locked her child in the car, the, the mom would frantically get attention of anyone she thought that could possibly help them. When I was younger, my stepbrother and I, we used to uh, ride dirt bikes, and we created this motocross track that was pretty spectacular, by the way, uh, out in the back 20 without ever telling our parents that we did it. But uh, they found out later, uh, and then thankfully years had gone by, and their uh, punishment was waved away. But we just did this incredible track. And I remember my stepbrother was getting really good at coming into these berms, and he could lay his motorcycle right down almost parallel with the ground and come shooting out and then hit the next jump. And so he wanted me to see, and so he, he, I'd stop, I'd position, turn my bike off, I'm watching. He comes flying into this, this berm, he's going to show off, and he comes in, and what it looks like to me is he just <clears throat> crashes. I'm laughing, I'm like, oh, that's super cool, great job, until he starts screaming at the top of his lungs. And what I didn't know had happened is he had gotten so low that the tip of his boot caught the ground and snapped his leg. That's why he crashed. So now I'm hearing him scream bloody murder and I come over and I get the, the bike off from him. But the, meanwhile, I had thrown my bike off. And if you know anything about motors, once you turn the, on the side, the, the carburation's filling up with fuel. I flooded the motor. I couldn't get it to start. And so I'm about 500 yards away from the house and I go beat feet in for the house. I must have been only about 50 feet away, 100 feet away from my stepbrother at this point, And I'm already screaming with everything within me for my mom. And my mom was down in the basement, in the laundry room, and heard my scream, my panic scream for help, actually thought I was overreacting. Uh, and when she opened the door, was ready to scold me because uh, she thought I was just typically, you know, like a, a young boy would be, just over-exaggerating. Uh, well, when I screamed from the field, she could hear me say, come quick, Chris's leg is broke. 
Well, they jumped in the vehicle and we went and rescued him, took him to the emergency room and got him all fixed up. You see, I didn't care what I sounded like. I didn't care what I looked like. There was a problem. And I was crying out, screaming out for help. And this phrase, crying out, is something that you see repeated over and over with the children of Israel. They would do something stupid or, and, and drift away and go uh, worship other gods or go where God told them not to. And then when they were entrapped or broken or, or, or enslaved, they would cry out. And time after time, the goodness of God would rescue them. The word there, the phrase cried out, it means to scream for help without reservation. This is, a, this is a, an intensity of, of just recklessness to get your, uh, the help that you need. It also means to be in distress. And one of the translations is to shriek. I mean, you don't even sound logical any longer. You're just trying to get attention. Some of us are so full of pride and appearances that even though our life, our health, our marriages, our finances are in a wreck, we still won't cry out. Some people tell me, well, Pastor Phil, I just don't feel that God's very close or I don't sense his presence. And the truth is, in some cases, we're playing it so safe, there's no need for him anyway. Or, listen, I'm gonna just be, I'm gonna be a little bit punchy on this, but sometimes it, isn't it okay just to hear the truth if, if it's gonna help you, even if it steps on toes? So if I, if I say some of us are so full of pride, the truth is some of us are. We're so full of appearances. We're so wanting to be dignified that we, we are stopping the blessing of God. We're, we're not breaking through to get the, the miracle that we're believing God for. And the moment you encounter or we encounter resistance beyond our ability, we stop. And we end up stopping short of seeing the breakthrough. This morning, if you have your Bibles or devices, turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to read to you from verse number 29. This is Jesus and his crowd. It says, as they went, in Matthew 20, verse 29, as they went out uh, of Jericho, a great multitude followed them. Now, the word great there, uh, it actually is a funny phrase as to the terminology of what it means. It means long. Uh, it does mean big. There was a multitude of people, but it means there was a whole trail of people that were following him. And the multitude there uh, actually is, is a, a term within their language to talk about a chaotic group. If you've ever been in a, a, a junior high auditorium with a bunch of middle schoolers that are all talking, there's chaos. You've got kids just making noise. Dog, 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 dog. You've been around a 10-year-old boy. They just make noises. At least mine does all the time. Now, multiply that by 100, or people trying to talk over one another. Chaos. I think it's important to note that as they're, they're going down the road, there's a long line of people that are following Jesus. They're blown away by what they've seen. They're not going to stay put, and they're talking and over-talking people, and so they're walking down the road. This is, I want you to understand the chaos would be very difficult to hear one another. And behold, in verse 30, two blind men were sitting by the road. When they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, that's shrieking, screaming without reservation. They cried out saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. And then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet, but they cried out all the more. They didn't back down. They didn't be quiet. They got louder saying, have mercy on us, O, uh, o Lord, son of David. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes might be opened. And so Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes and immediately, say immediately, immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. These two blind men were screaming and their intensity went up because they wouldn't be dismissed. They, they wouldn't be denied and they weren't getting louder in order to get God's attention. Now here's a, a note for some of us charismatics. You shouting in your prayer time is not because God has a hard time hearing you. Okay, you can talk. You can have a conversation, but why were they getting so loud? Was it because if they didn't, Jesus wouldn't see they were serious? No, they would not be denied by the chaos and the noise of their situation. And so they cried out even more. They were unwavering in their faith against the opposition and they would not be denied. They were not going to let this moment pass them. They were gonna get their eyesight. And Jesus stopped in the midst of all of the noise and the busyness. And he asked them, what do you need? And immediately they received their eyesight. Look with me at another example, Mark chapter two. 
Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. I want to read the first 12 verses. Mark chapter 2, verse number 1. Again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was so that... So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. So let me just set the stage here. That would be like this space right here, but yet in a house, so jam-packed that they're flowing out the door because they're so interested in what Jesus is going to communicate. And these men have heard the same things that all these others have heard, and they've journeyed from afar. They have brought their paralytic friend, carrying him on a board, not sure how many miles they had traveled to be there with him. But when they got there, and they found that the people were pouring out the doors, there was no way to get in. Well, I guess we missed our chance, guys. I guess we should have showed up earlier. I guess we should have, uh, uh, should have known that we weren't going to get in there after all, and uh, let's just head back home. Is that what happened? No. No, they wouldn't be denied either. And so they climbed on the roof and they opened the roof up. Imagine, we're sitting here communicating God's word and all of a sudden, the tile starts falling down on top of you. And here comes a fella laying on a platform because someone was going to get healed. They weren't going to be denied. That doesn't excite someone. I mean, they were were not going to turn around. When you and I meet opposition against something that we're believing God for, stop quitting. Look at your neighbor. Point your finger. Make it serious face. Stop quitting. Come on, say it like you mean it. Like you're scolding a child. Stop quitting. Right? Some of y'all don't scold your children like that, but apparently I do. Number, verse number five. And by the second row said amen. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now I'm going to fast forward just a minute because the the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, those that were in religious authority, they hated that Jesus said your sins are forgiven. So he goes on to teach them, look, y'all don't like that. How about I just say, take up your mat and go home. And so that's what he does. And the fellow gets off his, his, uh, the, the platform and walks out of there amazed. And look at verse number 12. Immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went out in the presence of all of them so that they were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. We never saw anything like this because it defies natural law. And if it happened for someone who was determined to be touched by Jesus then, If he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, then the same is true for you, and the same is true for me. Some of us that are here this morning, and that will be here in the following services, or the weeks to come, are coming to church because they're looking for something. They're looking for more. Not everyone who shows up in church already believes in God. Isn't that something? That actually uh, really trips up the religious mind. You mean unbelieving people can come to your church? I sure hope so. Right? Because there's some folks that need to belong sometimes before they'll ever believe. And we're going to make space for them. We're going to make room for them. People don't look like us, talk like us, don't smell like us. You know, I would, uh, I'm going to keep going. Can we just really be prepared? I, I, the Lord challenged me on this. Several months ago, I did a funeral and I went to this funeral home. And this is the funeral home that poor people go to. I, I don't know how to say it. It was the most downtrodden, unattractive funeral home I'd ever seen. It was not, it was, uh, it was not pleasant even to the, not only the eyes, but to the, to the smell. Okay, so here I am, I'm waiting, and the place is filling up with people that were not like the people I'm normally around. I'm not going to give any more descriptions of that because it's going to make me sound worse than I already feel about how I'm saying it. But, but it began, I began to identify within my own heart. I was judging every one of them. I was shocked by the clothes they were wearing. I thought it was very disrespectful and some of the lack of clothes. I was offended by their odor. The place stunk. And instantly the Lord spoke to me, what are you doing? They need you. And I I had to go find a corner in that funeral home and, and, and cry out to God because I stand before you guys every week and say, hey, we need to love the unlovable. We need to, we need to reach those that are broken, not like us. And I didn't mean it. Clearly. 
Because here I was judging these people who I say we should be loving. And then the next thing I thought, Lord, is our church ready for this? What if next weekend we are flooded with people like I'm describing to you? Are we ready? We need to be. We need to be. If we're really going to reach this region, it's not going to just be all the cleaned up pretty people. Okay. We use terms like breakthrough, overcoming, more than conquerors. If you're going to break through something, that means that there's resistance, right? Right? If it's tough, you're gonna have to break through it. Overcoming means that you're, there's an obstacle that I need to overcome, climb, to defeat, to be a conqueror. That means there's gonna be a fight. I'm promised, you're promised to be more than conquerors because Jesus conquered it all and I'm in him. So that makes me more than a conqueror, but that does not mean that I'm not gonna face resistance. So people, when we look at Genesis chapter one, there's this reoccurring phrase that I noticed and I'm sure that you've seen it too. It goes like this. So the evening and the morning were the second day. And then a few verses later, after some more creation happens, it says, so the evening and the morning were the third day, and so on and so on. What's the point here? We call morning the daybreak. Your new day, your breakthrough will come out of darkness. It's faith because you can't see already. Otherwise, it's not faith. So if you feel like you're in the dark, you can't see what's next, you're at the exact spot you need to be for a breakthrough. Your breakthrough, your new day, the dawning of a new day is going to start in darkness. Look at the theme of Exodus. I've got four points that I begin to notice. It begins in darkness, but it ends with light. It begins with slavery, but it ends in freedom. It begins with the absence of God, And it ends with the presence of God. It begins with God out of sight and it ends with God in sight. Last week, Bishop did an amazing job talking about our perspective and perception. I want to just, I want to go a little bit deeper on this because I think there's such value and power in both of these perception and our perspective. So by simply defining the two, perception is the facts. It is what it is. It's not denying. My perception is seeing what it really is. Perspective, however, is what I now do with what I see. Okay, perception is the fact. It is what it is. Perspective is now what I do with the information I currently have. Author and speaker Andy Andrews has this to say about perspective. He says, perspective is the only thing that can dramatically change the results without changing any of the facts. If you're taking notes and you have the ability, you should leave this on the screen long enough for people to write this down because this is important. You're gonna, you're gonna look back on this moment, on this definition, because you're going to be faced. Anytime we talk about struggle and breakthrough and, and things that are gonna come against you, if I talk on money, guess what the enemy's gonna try to attack? Your money. If I talk on healing, guess what the enemy's gonna try to attack? Your body. So take this note. Perspective is the only thing that you can, or that can dramatically change the results without changing any of the facts. Perception concerns what is, but perspective concerns our ability to direct what happens from that point forward according to our interpretation of what it is. Here's a great analogy that I read this last week about perspective. So the average, the average fast food chain, regardless of what it is, the average fast food chain restaurant has a annual gross profit average of $800,000, okay? The average. So that means the no-name fast foods all the way up to the name that everyone knows. So the average gross profit for a fast food restaurant is $800,000 annually. They have done studies and it's proven that the number one day for a fast food restaurant is Sunday. And so like McDonald's is, is open Most of them are open 24 hours a day. Most of them are open seven days a week. And on Sundays, they staff extra in preparation for the busy crowd. Now, McDonald's is above average, a lot above average on their annual gross profits at 2.6 million per store is their average. Now, in comparison, Chick-fil-A has access to the same facts, the same perception, the same information, the same data. And yet Chick-fil-A has made a decision, those that run it, they are never open 24 hours. They've made the decision to never operate on Sunday. 
They believe that their employees and people uh, having an opportunity to have rest with their family or go to church if they desire, and they have the same perception. The same facts say that you're missing out on this busy day. Because they're not open 24 hours a day and because they're not open seven days a week, they are closed or are open 52 fewer days per year collectively. Now, their perspective is powerful because their average store gross profit is $4 million. The power of perspective. Your breakthrough is, is not going to be because the facts changed. Your breakthrough is because your perspective is going to change. What are you going to do with the information? We need inspiration in the toughest times. We need inspiration in those dark moments. The word, the word is broken into two different words. Uh, the, the word spire is actually an architectural term. It's the highest point. It's the focal point of a building. Churches actually are a great analogy because a steeple would be the spire. It points up. When you are facing your most difficult times, you need someone to help you look up, face up. But the word inspire, it means to breathe life into so conversely, expire means when life has left something. When you're up against the most difficult times of your life, the most challenging things, a miracle defying all of the logic or scientific method, you need inspiration. And some have gone to church looking for inspiration from God and found religion. And religion, instead of bringing them inspiration or life, it robbed them of their peace. It robbed them of their peace and it brought them anxiety. Why? Because religion or the religious system focuses on the doings, not the one. Now, I understand there is pure and undefiled religion, but when I'm talking about ceremonial religious acts, the emphasis being on what you do. And so when we find people going to churches looking for inspiration from God and found religion, and it only frustrates them more and brings more anxiety. Why does it bring anxiety? I wrote this quote down. Religion brings anxiety because you never know where you stand with God. When we meet resistance, we're left to conclude that God has rejected us or our effort wasn't enough. And so we discount, we stop, and we don't press on. Inspiration is most available when we meet resistance. Look with me at a short, familiar verse, Psalm 86, verse number 7. In the day of my peace, I will call upon the Lord. Y'all aren't awake yet. I did that on purpose. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. In the time of my trouble, I will call on the Lord, and he will answer me. In resistance, in, in the time of struggle, in the time of trouble, is when we need inspiration the most, and it's when the most available to you and I. Look at Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present, say very present, Uber present help in trouble. Inspiration comes in trouble more than any other time. Inspiration, life breathed into, it shows up in trouble. Look at Genesis chapter two, verse number seven. And the Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils and the breath of life breathed into. And the man became a living being. The King James says he became a living soul. Your soul is where the anxiety is. In your mind, your intellect, the way you're processing things. It's in resistance and troubles that I call upon the Lord and he breathes life into me. I'm inspired now to press on, to move forward. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse number nine. You see, when an athlete trains, how many here uh, go to the gym, exercise, ride a bike, or at least know somebody who does that kind of thing, right? <laughs> So when you do training, you do resistance training, you're putting a demand on the body. It's, it makes the muscles stronger. When you press the body and you have resistance, I know those that go to a gym who used to lift five pounds after, when it was really hard. After a while, that weight's not very hard anymore. You need, a, a, you need more weight. How is that? Because you're, you're actually getting stronger. But when you go for a run, you go for a bike ride, or you get on an elliptical machine, there's resistance on your body. And what happens? You need to breathe more. So instead of running from resistance, when we face resistance and there's a demand, there's more need for breath. Breathe deep. He's an ever-present help in time of need. 
He is my inspiration. It's not about your ability. It's not about your strength. It's about his. And this is the, the, the basis of who we are as a church. God's grace is more than just uh, covering our sin. It's his empowerment to live this life of victory. Finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number nine. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient. Say sufficient. sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon me. I'm going to boast in my weakness. I'm not going to allow pride and fear to dictate me any longer. I'm not going to allow these resistance or these roadblocks that come up to say, oh, this must be a sign from God. I'm not going to let the loud noises of the crowds and everything going on stop me from crying out recklessly to God. Sometimes in worship, it amazes me how safe some people must feel. It's evident by your, your lack of, of, of connecting with God. Not that I'm sitting here staring at people worshiping. I'm up front. My back is to you. But I just know I've been around church people. I've been around Christians. We're, we're so self-conscious about it. Do you know we have to set a stage for people? Do you know there's a reason why we have the lights drawn low? It's because people are insecure. They're self-conscious. I, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's truth. So we want to create an environment so that you can have your eyes off your neighbor and so we create environments of worship and help lead people. Do you know why we close our eyes when we pray? So we stop looking at the thing that's scaring us. There's no reason to keep our eyes closed. Just saying. Christy, would you come up here, please? I've got just three minutes left. And here's my challenge to you. I want, I want to invite anybody that would stand right now and say that I'm not going to be intimidated by my neighbor. I'm not going to be intimidated by the situations. I'm actually going to cry out. I'm not going to ask that you shriek and scream. Maybe some of y'all should. But in a posture of saying, I want more. I'm not settling. I'm going to worship for just the next two minutes. Go ahead, ushers. You can even bring the lights down now that I put most everybody under condemnation. <laughs> Sorry about that. Listen to these words the first time around. And then when she begins to sing it the second time, I want you to, to come from the depths of who you are. It's, Lord, I need you. Most powerful prayer, I believe that we could say, I need you. I'm incapable of doing this myself. Father, we repent turn our eyes on you. Help our unbelief this morning. Take us out, please.
but an inspiration that's been breathed into us as we leave this place now to go and face down, to conquer those things that are intimidating us. We humble ourselves and we admit that we're powerless over this, but we also recognize that all of heaven is available for those who are poor enough to receive it. And so we boast in our weakness so that the power of Christ may rest on us. Father, we thank you for favor that's on our lives to live a life of abundance as we leave this place and go into our homes, very specially into our homes, that we'd be anointed to husband and to wife and to parent and the grandparent. The blessing of God on our lives to go into the marketplace and those that we have influence with and over, that we carry this with us, that we face down these obstacles as we cry out we thank you, Lord, for an intensity that's stirred within us. I pray that it wouldn't just fizzle out, but it would go with us as we leave this place. I declare these things so in Jesus' name. Amen.